Hello all Happiness Egg Shape listeners and watchers, this is the Happiness Is podcast with me your host Bruce Aitchison, brought to you in association with Infinity Blue. They can look after you whether it is a checkup, teeth whitening or a more complicated procedure. Give them a call, get in touch and they will look after you to make sure that you keep that smile intact because after all, they know, we know, I know, you know, Happiness Is Egg Shaped. Hello and welcome to the Happiness Is podcast with me, your host, Bruce Aitchison from Happiness Is Egg Shaped. And you don't often see me nervous. It's only happened maybe a handful of times, but today is one of those days because we have a guest that I, I just find absolutely spectacularly inspiring and someone that we just watched on that TV the other night with their brand new documentary that's the follow-up to the book and they continue to work tirelessly to make sport better for everyone and that's something that I hope we're going to stress as we go through this podcast. Ridiculously busy so we can waste no further time. Another MBE on the show which we love. Please welcome the one and the only Sue Anstis. Hello there. Hello. Wow. What an introduction. Thank you. Well, I am. I'm, I'm a little bit nervous because this one feels <laughs> this one feels big. So let's waste no time at all. As I was just chatting to you off air, I watched the documentary with my family, my wife and my two girls, and there was so much in it in such a short space of time. How does it feel now that you're out the back of it? You've watched it. You know that other people have watched it. What's the reaction been? Yeah, um... Even better than I had anticipated. I hoped it would be well received, but it definitely has been um, a bit more emotional for people, I think, as a watch at, at all ages and, and stages, uh, associations with sports. So, yeah, I've been really delighted, um, but almost pleasantly surprised uh, by the reception. Yeah, just over a month now that it's been out and I'm still getting every evening messages from people that are, are finding it on Netflix. I feel like I need to watch it again. Be, be, uh, largely because of that emotion you get a little bit hung up on certain moments and I feel like I need to go back and just recap again did, did it feel the same this time is there something new in it which I think there will be have you had people say they've watched it more than once I have I have it's really interesting isn't it I, I've watched it many times as you might imagine and even now when I watch it there's still nuances and things that I see in some of the interviews and the um, content and you know I've been so close to it for so long so absolutely I have heard people watching it three or four times yeah. uh, which is fantastic and but as you say I think there's a lot in there in the hour it's um Jack Tompkins is the my co-director uh, producer editor and actually his ability to take so much incredible content and weave it together in, in an hour you know is to be massively praised but I think because of that as you say there's almost an awful lot in there and perhaps sometimes not not those huge pauses that you might get if you if it was part of a, a six series documentary or it was a three hour film or something. So I think yeah, there's lots packed in there. There's two things. One, I'll also love the outtakes at the end. I always love outtakes. So well, well played on that. Um, but the other bit too is what was left on the cutting room floor? There must have been content where you thought, ah, oh, I wish that was in. Yeah, no, it's really hard, isn't it? And it's the bits you then put in. And as you say, we were chatting off air and there's a bit that when um, that you mentioned your daughter's liked in terms of my chatting to uh, Molly down in Sussex. Um, and that was a bit that we put in later on. I said, oh, I think that needs to go in. So there is stuff that went in, but obviously the bits I kept adding in are the bits that other stuff had to come out then too. So uh, yeah, it's hard. And, and there is some footage. Obviously there's amazing, uh, well, I'm sure we'll talk, but some fantastic rugby footage and there's you know netball boxing um and the euros too but not so much of that because actually there were these amazing amazing people to talk to who had so much fantastic information to share and it was that mixture so you you had uh, so i loved the bits that were you i loved the the outdoor swimming the walking netball because those are going to hit more of the population than the bits about the Red Roses or the Lionesses or um, the professional netballers, the athletes. Did you want to be a professional athlete? Was that something that came into your head as a as a kid or a student? 
No, that's an interesting. interesting I've, not been, I've been asked that before. Um, no, I wanted to be, I was a track athlete. So I swam as a youngster and I swam like to the nation, nationals, but I was about 20th or so, nothing amazing. And then I was a county track and field athlete. So I think I would have liked to have had a GB vest as an athlete, but I didn't do, I played netball at school, uh, but nothing to a ridiculously high standard. And obviously there wasn't really rugby, there wasn't really football or cricket. or So I think had there been more team sport, maybe that would have been a path. Um, but, you know, no professionalism. No, it wasn't really a career path to follow um, in the 70s and 80s. So, um, so yeah, I think I'd like to have done more in athletics. So I think having been a, a track and field athlete, my brother was an international pole vaulter and decathlete. So I think I wanted to be like him. <laughs> I think that would be something that I wanted would be, you know, to compete on the international stage, but not really as a professional athlete because I don't think there really was an, an opportunity, not even lottery funding in those days. That's how long ago it was, Bruce. <laughs> but that's, uh, so Tamara Taylor was on here and I asked her that question of, did you need to see it? And she said, no. She said she was just doing what she was doing. She loved it. She knew she was good at it. She, she progressed through. Whereas others have said their hero was a male athlete because that was all they could see. But some, so Lisa Thompson, all she wanted to do was to be a rugby player. She Nothing else came into her head. She wanted to be a rugby player. But others, you know, Rona Lloyd, who, who I'm sure you know, Rona went to uni change degree is, is one of those eternal students she's going to have about 25 degrees by the time she's finished um because that seemed to be the way to continue the thing she loved which was sport but there wasn't too many avenues to be a professional athlete how important then is it with the people you've spoken to that they can see it to believe it yeah, absolutely. And I'm a massive Rona Lloyd fan as well, too. So, yeah, amazing woman. Um, so, yeah, I think it is so important, isn't it? And I think, we, you know, I, it's a slightly trite, isn't it? You've got to see it to believe it. I think we, we've heard that so much over the years. But I do think it is so true. And for women from all backgrounds and um, a real kind of diverse role models too is so important as well so I, I do think it it absolutely does and we just see the impact of that don't we in terms of success across rugby and, and cricket and football those big team sports that perhaps haven't had that profile in the past but now girls are flocking to them so there definitely is the proof that it does make you know without doubt make a difference because you can believe it could be something so I, I do feel it's having impact and see it in that way. There's so much that's happened recently that has made it look better. Now, I tread carefully when I say this, but I had quite a, a long conversation with someone. I was at an under-18 international um, hockey competition in Glasgow. And I said, and I, I told them they had to let me clarify it. I said, how attractive is this? Now, my point was the kids were in kit that worked. It wasn't baggy t-shirts and the skirt the, the, it looked great they were athletic they were agile they were aggressive they celebrated when they scored they were disciplined I remember watching one of the players was carded and she sprinted to the seat to sit down so the, the time would start and it and it was on the main pitch there was a crowd the scoreboard it looked great that's important to get people involved isn't it how it looks yeah, absolutely. And I remember talking years ago with um, Sally Mundy about hockey and getting hockey mainstream television coverage. Um, but actually, at the time, even her reflecting in terms of the, the fans and the size of the crowd that's there and the, the, you know, the quality of play. It wasn't within National League or wherever it was without those big international games. Does that bring the broadcasters? Does it bring the fans? So everything needs to be in place to. And I think that's why we've seen this growth recently is finally we're getting all those things in place. So it is about quality of play. It is about great production and coverage. But also, if you said having it on the right pitches with a crowd there, too, it does all make a difference. It makes a difference to your experience as a spectator as well. I and mean, we've all been to games, you know, like and I think about the going down to Twyford Avenue and watching Wasps when there's a few, you know, people in the crowd and then go rocking up at Twickenham to the Six Nations uh, earlier this year and just being part of that crowd. And, and you know, the, the play was amazing too, but actually the experience that you have as a fan changes your thoughts towards the sport and what could be in the sport too. And I think, not it's overlooked, but I think sometimes we forget, important for the players, but also for the spectators and fans and that experience you have. 
Right, I'm going to pick up on that. The the fan experience. I've been going to sports since I I can remember. The the fan experience now or spectator experience now. Women's sport is an amazing place, and I've got two kids. We go. There is very little aggression in the crowd. The alcohol doesn't appear to be the main driver for being there. The atmosphere is really supportive in the way it should be. But the athletes remain so accessible. They hang around for an hour after the final whistle to take every selfie, sign every ball. Are we going to lose that as the game becomes more professional? I've read something recently about can we remain true to our roots? Is that something that concerns you? Or are you just happy that because the foundations appear to be strong, they'll stay? I, it does. It concerns me slightly, and I feel it's a little bit inevitable, especially with professional sport as agents get involved. And it's definitely something I think we're seeing a bit more on the football side, probably rather than necessarily um, with rugby, cricket, netball. I'm just talking main team sports at the moment. Um, so, so it does concern me. Um, but I, so I think we, that's why we're talking about it and we do talk about it, what it has, what women's sport has that differentiates it from men's, if you, if you are comparing the two, uh, and hoping that we can work to keep that uh, for the future. So that collaboration, that different feel within, you know, the, the lack of vitriol and hatred and anger and tribalism that comes with men and men's football primarily, but also you might experience that a little bit at some of the cricket, you know, and some of the rugby probably less so but um but how do we celebrate and amplify that and there are others that would say actually we need that we need that tribalism and people to be committed to a team so that they'll buy kit and merchandise and season tickets and but it's really interesting isn't it? so I look at me as a fan of sport and women's sport so I've never followed much men's my dad was a Chelsea fan I've never followed much uh men's football really but I'm a massive fan of women's sport and women's rugby but if you ask me who I who is my team in you know PWR yeah, well, sometimes it's Loughborough because I went to Loughborough and I'm so passionate about that. But actually, I love Wasp because Molly was on the academy there and I love Nolly and Giselle and all that they did with Wasp. But then I'm also now a massive fan of Lost a Heartbreak and what they're doing. So we did a lot of work with Harlequin. So, I, so I'm changeable. But actually, I love it. But it doesn't mean I won't go and watch it. Actually, it's great. I've got so much I want to watch because I'm interested. You know, we're filming with Bristol at the moment. So actually, yeah, all these different teams. And I'm the same probably for net, even with netball. So, so this week, we've got the World Cup starting on Friday and I'm excited for the England-Jamaica game. But I'll also watch Australia New Zealand. You know, I, I love it and I want to watch it. And, you know, similarly with the cricket too. So I do feel um, perhaps a bit, it can be done differently, that you can be a fan of a sport, the whole of a sport and watch different games, maybe without having to have that tribalism and even if you do then commit to a team and you buy a season ticket without the hatred and the negativity uh, and that aggression that comes with so much of male sport yeah I, I think we need to hold on to that for dear life because it's it's a real winner I'll, I'll give you this little story the commonwealth games sevens final was the day that the lionesses won so there's however many in that stadium in Coventry, I don't know, 30,000, 35,000 people. The atmosphere was great anyway because it was sevens. And then they announced, the stadium announcer announced it. Now, I was on my phone keeping updates and as were people around me and we were, the people behind me started to ask what the score was. And then they announced it and the whole place just erupted. And it was a, a goosebumps on the back of my neck here because I feel like, that was a moment that we, my family, experienced that wouldn't have happened two years ago, five years. To, you know, there would have been a what? What was going on? What? What was that? You know, or they wouldn't have even announced it. When you when you hear stories like that, and you you've been part of big moments like that, do you pinch yourself? Yeah, we are right in the middle of extraordinary change. I mean, that's the thing I I realize, and I'm kind of you're kind of working on it, doing it all the time. And then uh, when you sit and reflect, and, and not and I guess the change in crowd sizes and audiences and viewing figures and sponsorships, but also in access, the fact that we're having conversations around clothing and kit and all those things that are so kind of prevalent in discussions at the moment. 
that wouldn't have been, as you say, even five years ago, how different things are. So that really excites me because I think we are seeing change. And I absolutely see that domino effect of things happening in one sport and then they're moving across and others looking or things happening in one country and one nation and then moving elsewhere so I feel really excited there's so much to do but it's really exciting time to see that and for you and your family to you know to be in that moment and experience that is incredibly I had COVID on the day of the Euros final I wasn't able to get to Wembley first time I got it actually was on that morning but there you go (laughs) <laughs> so you do remember that vividly <laughs> watched it all from home but like you I was watching the sevens final and uh, uh, yeah and the lionesses too the the lionesses have I mean they deserve every recognition because what they did was an amazing achievement in itself but then the the ripple effect of that Jill Scott goes away and becomes a celebrity which was imp- it might seem ridiculous but it was recognition of what what she had done. The interest this year, you know, my my daughter, we're Scottish, you know, we support Scott. My daughter wants the pink England tracksuit that they wore <laughs> on the plane. To, you know, the the kit. We mentioned it just in passing there. It is important because that's one of the ripple effects, isn't it? If the professionals are wearing that, then your amateur participation level person's going to be wearing the right kit which will make them feel better yeah it is it is, isn't it? and it is interesting isn't it the whole I could do a whole other uh, hour couldn't we on sustainability and football kit and encouraging people to buy things they don't need and then in the world of disposable clothing um but i absolutely agree and i think there's definitely something you know about making it desirable and making it aspirational uh, in a way I couldn't have told you what the England kit might have been like five, ten years mm. ago. But the fact that it's uh, that and that link to fashion, you know, and all that Leah Williamson's doing with Gucci and all that bringing sport and fashion and music and those things together in the women's sports space is so, so powerful. And yeah, long may that continue and grow. You had on the documentary, you know, one one of the allies who's really public. And this is something that I find interesting, this male ally thing i find the language around it interesting that's maybe for another day but ugo monye has been you know to the forefront i believe i didn't see it but i believe he got quite emotional at the premier when he was asked a question in football ian wright's been very vocal he's now on the mns advert with you know the female players and the that's important do is that needing to be seen as well do the males need to see those allies for that to be a ripple effect. It does. I I believe so. I absolutely believe so. I mean, I, you mentioned that in terms of that whole. Do we term them male allies? Are they just fans of a sport? But I think. Um, I can quote uh, Tess, my daughter of a documentary, until we have equality. You know, every man needs to be a male ally. We do need more, and I think it is about those fantastic men that have great visibility and profile and, and an audience like Ian Wright and Ugo and Andy Murray and others. But it's also the men that are in decision-making positions at the broadcasters, you know, that are buying the rights of sport, the sponsors, those sitting on councils and committees and making decisions about who plays where and where the funding goes and so on. So I do think uh, those with big public profile, that is fantastic. And there are many, there are many behind the scenes that you know, many men that are in those positions and not just because they've got families and daughters, but because they understand the value of equality, that it's good for all. And also the, I guess what's changing now is seeing the commercial, you know, sadly we live in a capitalist society and people, you know, it is money that drives so much, isn't it? So, um, so I think seeing the commercial benefits that come now with investing, oh, women's sport, who knew people want to invest and fans and buy kit and buy tickets and sponsors coming to it and broadcasters paying for the rights for sport too. So I think as it's become more commercial, um, you know, we're seeing more males waking up to that too. But absolutely, there are those that have long been both behind the scenes and in front of camera uh, championing, you know, like you, like your good self, but, you know, making a, a difference in calling it out and, Because actually, and when you get close to it, you think, well, why wouldn't, you know, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you want um, equality? And then, you know, to almost double the audience that you've got for your sport if you really want it to progress and grow. So, yeah, I think it is really, it is really important. And I think those high profile men do make a difference. 
this is purely anecdotal based on my experience in this country and in and in rugby a lot of the coaches of women's teams and girls teams will be men um as as it usually is in youth sport it's a keen parent who's doing it um how long do you think it's going to take before we have the generation who are now playing who become, like you said, representatives on the council, on the board, the coaches, the treasurer, the secretary? How long do you think that's going to take? Because love it or hate it, and however controversial this may become, parenthood then still, you know, it takes the women out of a situation for a period of time, which then means commitment to it is difficult. How long do you think we can go before we see more women in those positions? I think if we let it, if we think it's just going to happen naturally, it'll take bloody forever and it won't be in our lifetime. So I, I do think, and that's why I feel, you know, whatever you feel about quotas and the need to have a certain percentage of, especially in those senior roles, you know, councils and committees and boards, I think that does need to happen. I think, sadly, things won't happen naturally because human beings are human beings and they're almost that homologous. You just recreate what you think is the best because that's what you've always known and therefore the the bloke that's like you that did it before, that, you know, he understands the game, but therefore you'll offer him that role. And we see that across all disciplines but within sport but within society um so i do think we need to put things in place to create that shift it won't happen naturally um and there are you know the rfu is working really hard to begin to help that and, I, and exactly as you say i think one of the issues for grassroots has been oh you never played the game you haven't played football you haven't played cricket or rugby mother therefore why do you think you could coach and come board you know but actually there are some amazing coaches that have never played to a high level too um so i think your question of how long will it take i think it'll take i think it'll take a long time to ever get to true equality if if we ever can do but i do think um we could make some big shifts by changing some attitudes of those in senior roles um to, to make it accessible and acceptable and a bit of that you know it's all those things and isn't it about role models it's about celebrating the women that are doing that it's about making funding and courses available sometimes for women only you know like you know whether people like it or not for a one woman to rock up onto a level three level four course and find it's all men that's really intimidating for women so making it accessible so many many different um avenues that need to be explored to make that happen but and i think it's a it's almost not just in, because it's right and it's equality. I think if we want to get more girls playing sports, uh, then many girls want to be coached by women too. And I think women bring a, do bring a, bring a different approach to coaching, um, especially at that grassroots level as well too. So I do think that's important if we want to encourage more more women and girls to play. How frustrated do you become? So anybody who's seen my social media over the last little while will know that I got to sit next to Judy Murray um, at a wedding and a wedding, bed, I know. <laughs> bed, bed, bed her year for a while. But Judy Murray has done an incredible amount for tennis, obviously for our boys, but she, lots of people will have ignored what she's done for, for the women's game, for the game in Scotland, for the game in the UK. She continues to try and support but then she's called all sorts of things and her attitude's this and she's the. How frustrated do you become when you see a situation like that? Here's somebody who, highly skilled, knowledgeable, enthusiastic, and because she's a woman, she's called this, that, the other, or she's... You know, does that bother you? Does that frustrate you? Or do you quite like that there's somebody who's willing to play that role? No, I don't like if someone wants to play that role. I really feel for her. I was very, I was very lucky. I had her on the Game Changers podcast, and in researching that, I read her autobiography, and we, you know, and I, I too, I kind of felt like I knew her. But when you see, also, what an amazing player she was too. Yeah. That almost gets passed over. Actually, she was an extraordinary tennis player too. So, I, yeah, I, I really feel for her, and you know, I'm I hugely commend her for retaining her presence and doing all she has with Fed Cup and going on to do things despite the vitriol of the media um, and others, you know, at that time. Um, yeah, so I don't, no, I don't think, I don't want anyone to have to play that role. Like, it frustrates me and it frustrates me a lot of the, the um, 
crap I guess that women's that the pundits and you know whether it's whatever sport have taken over time uh, but I do feel the more that we see the more that is changing so that you know there is there will all and I, I feel it's almost like a continuum there are some and it is men on you know on social media there are some men that whose views you're never going to change whatever we're talking about whatever field it is sport is just something that's very high profile and dear to them they're gonna rant and rave and be sexist and homogen um you know <laughs> misogynist rather um and there are others that are completely on board with it i guess the piece the pe men i want to reach are those in the middle that could almost go either way that that haven't had their eyes open to the power and potential of women's sport and why it's the right thing to do so i so i almost feel with uh, the experience that judy murray had it was almost those men that were in whatever walk of life were going to be um sexist and cruel in their kind of treatment of her but yeah I, I really kind of really feel for her and much admire all she's done and all she's done that we don't really always hear about behind the scenes coming back to that whole coaching and grassroots coaching and getting women coaching and women and girls playing and yeah she's done some incredible incredible work who do you look at now um you know i, I could list them off and some of them have been guests on here who do you look at now and think give them 10 years and they're going to be you know ruling the roost on a board on a committee i can see them you know donna kennedy's now on the uh at worcester warriors and giselle mather's now trailblazer you know and then you've got um women's football there now seems to be people who are getting themselves into positions where they can actually do something who do you look at now and you think they're they're going to change the game yeah they're there are so I'm going to not answer your question. There are so many of them. I mean, that's the thing I would say. So we set up the Women's Sport Collective, Kate, Anne and I, uh, kind of during COVID, so three years ago. We've got 6,000 members now, women working across sport. And then a couple of smaller groups, we've got a WhatsApp group of 100 amazing women across sport. And I look at any of them, so I'm not going to name anyone, because I could look at any of them and think... Oh, they are just the most, and often the most amazing women who have had to deal with lots of rubbish kind of in the progress of their careers or working in traditionally really male run sports and organizations and yet have have found a way to you know to succeed and progress yeah so I, I don't usually not answer a question on a podcast but I don't think I would answer a question but I think there are I would I would offend so many because there are I guess my reflection is there are so many extraordinary women out there um and it's great that they're they're supporting and collaborating I and mean, I think we definitely see that across not just women's sport but women working across women's and men's sport um is that desire to support each other and bring each other on and that's you know amazing to see so circling back to something i mentioned at the start is that what's keeping some of the values and respect and strong foundation because i read i think it was in the guardian saying that they weren't handed anything so why would you stay in it because you've had to fight for it you've had to stay true you've had to make sure that what you're doing is right because if not you'd be called out for it is there a danger that those who have gone into an academy at 14 and become a professional and who have not seen that is that why it's still so important to tell these stories I think I, I always feel it's so important to celebrate those that came before us because that's why we are here. We are here where we are, aren't we? And I sometimes worry it's a little bit danger. We almost um, make it very mythical and lovely, the kind of as it was in the past, or that women's sport is such a lovely, supportive, collaborative. And I and that is all the elements that I do love. But also, we want it to be commercial and we want it to be competitive. And we do. And there's all the other things that we like on the jeopardy of sport and the you know excitement of the game. So um, whilst I I want to celebrate all those traits and long may they remain in sport. I it, I don't want it to be a happy clappy. Uh, we're all you know that, that that we need some of that antagonism and the competition and it, it's those things that make you know make you want to watch a PWR game because it's <laughs> whatever Saris Queens or but when there's some history there between the players and the teams and and fantastic that they you know that, that we would expect that in men's sport as well as women's sport too so I wouldn't want to go too far down that line of actually we um and, and also that just because they're women, it doesn't mean to say they're all completely lovely and collaborative and whatever. <laughs> yeah, there is, there are, there are people, we're people in individuals. So that there's, you know, difference across all sports and across all teams too. When, so the Red Roses, you know, I, I love the Red Roses they're, and they're, 
their social media is fantastic because they're making themselves accessible, probably trying to make themselves as commercial as possible. You see them endorsing products um, who know, have no idea what level they're, they're getting, if they're just getting things for free or if they're getting paid to do it, but you can see it progressing. But the Red Rosie squad have given unbelievable access to you know their, their own documentary and the run-up to the World Cup. Those, those storytelling elements are crucial to building the fan base, aren't they? It's so, so important. And it is it, really interesting. Obviously, we had fabulous access uh, for Game On. And there is that balance, isn't there? Is that whole giving access, raising profile, and yet knowing those athletes, I want them to get paid, to get more money, to get more profile. Um, and I, I really feel for the female athletes right now, because I think they're right in the midst of it's so much better than it was before. And they've got professional contracts and they've got some sponsorship, but it's nowhere near where it should or could be or would have been had women's sport been, uh, you know, recognised and celebrated the way men's was 100 years ago. Um, so they're almost at the cusp of something that is amazing. But I also feel for them because and I think it's a danger that they look across at the men, this is especially in football, and like, I want to be like X, Y, and Z, and actually don't compare yourself to the men, and let's look at where you were and where it's going and make it sustainable. But I do kind of feel for them in that they're in a so much better place, but probably not quite the place that they we would want them to be in and they would want to be in either. So there are still sacrifices, to, not that it's a sacrifice to go out and spend an hour talking to fans in the game, or but, but they are giving that time. They're probably doing a lot more for less than... Um, they should be worth, uh, but that's because we're in a place where we're trying to all trying to grow the sport and to make it sustainable, so that in five, ten years' time, you know they can be paid more, and there are more sponsors, and there is you know p more being paid for broadcast rights, etc. Too. So I mass, I'm, I'm like you, massive fan of them, um, but I feel for them also. I think it's a it's a place to be celebrated, but it's a tough place to be too. Women's sport, I think, also reaches parts that men's sport isn't so we're watching a world cup and haiti are there yeah i mean how incredible is that and one of their players is you know playing at the top of the game well lots of their players are playing in, in france but they're they're being talked about as real potential we're, we're not going to see haiti i think at a men's world cup the netball you know when do you see malawi on an international stage other than in netball really so it's reaching other parts and when i was watching your documentary and when i was watching the red roses documentary i think the uk is doing okay would that be fair to say uh, do you look at other countries and think we could have some of that or i wish they had some of what we've got yeah, there's elements of it. And I guess it's almost the, uh, I do a lot of work, I look across from New Zealand, Australia and all that they're doing there and also in the US. Uh, but absolutely, I had a call with someone from South Africa last week and you look at the, t you know, how, just where they're struggling as a nation and where they're investing. I think absolutely we are in a really strong place. You know, we should um, recognise the strength of the position that we have, not just for, for rugby, but across so many sports. In fact, there are so many funded opportunities for um, athletes so much profile for sport um, but that but it's also important then isn't it and I know the RFU has done a huge amount of work in this space is to make sure that as a successful nation we're bringing on those countries the women's teams in there because that's what makes for an exciting WXV or for World Cup and you know other games in the future is to know that uh, there is that quality of play and opportunity for women across the world. So that uh, that really excites me, and I think that's a kind of fantastic attitude to have. It's great, great to be the best in the world, but not if you're beating everybody else and there's no one else to play. Um, so yeah, I think I think uh, sometimes we do need to stand back and think of how fortunate we are for all that we might complain about lack of enough funding. Uh, but yeah, in comparison to other places around the world, I think we're we're in a really good place. We we also we've spoken about um, board members and council members. So the the running gag for since long before I was born, what do you call a Scots person in the World Cup final? The referee, and then that's what we had in the the World Cup. Holly Davidson, who you know, talking of role models and game changers and. She's not there because she's a woman. She's there because she's very good at what she does. Um, officials, you know, the, the World Cup now, they get to stand on the sideline and announce the VR decision to the stadium, which is quite an interesting development. How pleasing is it to see officials 
taken that responsibility. Yeah, f- absolutely fantastic. And um, yeah, I spoke to Sean Massey um, Ellis on the podcast. Actually, she came to the uh, community premiere. It was really very lovely to see her for the first time we met in person. But amazing hearing her story and how you know she, how hard it has been for her to progress through. But as you say, and how hard she's had to work in terms of the fitness levels that are set that are are for men and men's bodies in terms of the speed and the endurance that she needs to meet to be able to referee at that kind of top level. Um, FIFA matches, Champions League, etc. So, uh, yes, it's ama- amazing to see. And I think sometimes we talk about women in sport and women's sport, but actually those working in sports are the coaches and the officials. And for me, that is has much to be celebrated because, um, yeah, getting that respect from people. I mean, the piece for me about sport has always been, I love women's sport, I love sport, but it's how it impacts beyond society, beyond the sport itself. So, um, how it changes men's attitudes to women and girls and boys' attitudes to um, their sisters, siblings, girls in school, etc. So I think, for me, it is about those athletes, but it's also about officials, and it's about female officials in male games um, and taking control and being respected and, and how that then might change opinions about women more broadly. So, yeah, I think it can be hugely, hugely powerful. And, again, it's hard, really hard, I think, hard to get in, hard to, get, hard to progress and... Um, especially as a senior female referee or official linesman in a, in male sports, because it's so competitive anyway. I, I admire anyone that does that and anyone that we see at the top. You don't just get to go to the top. You have to have been on that amateur mm-hmm. pitch with, you know, supporters with access, no rope, no security. They could tell you exactly what they think. So when you see someone reach the top, and for women, it's probably harder because a lot of the progress would likely have been in men's sport. So those stories, I, I'm looking forward to Holly Davidson's autobiography and documentary because <laughs> she did one for World Rugby and it was great. But I would really like to get to the nitty gritty when she's finished and hear exactly what it was like. She's she's an amazing lady. Um, when, when you look at, we've got netball coming up. The football's on TV. Um, we've got WXV coming up. The cricket's on. Um, was it Nigel Farage said it's being rabbed down our throats? <laughs> <laughs> and Victoria Rush had to have a go. I mean, she's another phenomenal lady that's that's doing great things to, to support. It's not being rammed down our throat. We've just got choice now. Yeah, absolutely. How fantastic. And I, I, you, I'm like you, I'm like, I'm watching the women, Tour de France de Femme at the moment, but it's like, how am I going to find time to watch so much? You know, the last, the cricket's been amazing, the Ashes this summer. So yeah, I, I, what an amazing opportunity to have that choice uh, in a way that men have had for <laughs> hundreds of years. That at last, it's it's kind of really opening up. And I, I guess the, the challenges can then be in terms of the amount of free to air broadcast time there is for sport and whether um you know and i think that's been a bit of a view in the past isn't it especially if you listen to some of the sky sports you look at some of the the um twitter feed of that of actually seeing women's football wsl is it is it stopping the, um you know the, the men's sport being bought and then being broadcast too uh, but yeah i completely disagree how amazing that there is such fantastic uh, sport to consume on an ongoing basis now Going back to Loughborough, you, you're a you're a student at Loughborough. What did sport look like then for a for a student to what you're now experiencing? You know, when you went to visit for the documentary, your your daughter's involved. What do you see the difference? Is there a difference? Yeah, there is. There definitely is a difference. Um, and I don't think I know. I think I say this in documentary. I don't think I noticed it at the time. I think when I was there in the eighties, it kind of was as it was. So we, when I was went out with a rugby boy at the time, but we would go and watch the boys' games on Wednesday at the pitches at Loughborough. But it was all centered around, you know, the first team rugby. So I, and I don't think I ever thought, oh, where are the girls play? You know, and, then the, and that's where Lisa Burgess and Amanda Bennett and whatever were playing at the time. But it wasn't as if we'd have gone on to watch all their big crowds for them. So I think, but I just accepted it. I don't think I would kind of noticed it was particularly um, an issue at the time. So going back now, I think it is much better. I think having spoken to Molly down at Sussex, I think it is still an issue for them in terms of access to the pitches, I mean, they're just leaving now, actually. So I can probably say this as they won't be playing uh, with the team next year. Um, 
but I remember one of the finals, and it might have been the the um, game against Brighton, where the women's team played, and then and they had was like one linesman and one whatever on a bit of a pitch, and then the the men's game came on, and they had mic'd up refs that came on, and, and you know it's for the same game, but a completely different level of support and crowd and backing. So I do think it's better. Uh, but I'd be interested if you did talk to universities and I've done a little bit of that whole looking at university websites and seeing how much is is the male side, how much is the is it super 15s at Bucks, yeah. how much of it is still around the the men and boys sport versus the women's. I think they're definitely better. Um, but uh, so I think it says so improved, but I'm I've been really interested to know from uh, girls that are experiencing it right now how just how much equality there is and I guess some of that then filters down from a national level of what's happening with the from the FA and the RFU and whatever and, and where, where it reaches university sport too I don't I don't think it's probably as uh, equal as I'd like to believe it should be 35 whatever years on did was there a moment was there a eureka moment where you not necessarily stopped but thought hang on we need to do something for women's sport here so it, it sounds like as a student, you were a bit naive to, you just, you were doing what you were doing. Was there a moment at a certain age or a certain event where you thought, hang on a minute, I need to stamp my feet a little bit here? I don't, I can't think of a, of a specific moment. I think I drifted, not drifted, I'm going to move into it. So I did, I ran a sports PR agency for 25, 26 years. I worked for Gatorade, the American sports drink. So we did loads of stuff with uh, sport in the UK, uh, with t national teams and governing bodies and football, but it was all men's. But I don't, and again, that's, that's in my 20s. I don't think I ever thought, well, that's really odd. We're not doing much within women's sport. So I, so even then, I think I wasn't as aware of it. And then I remember I've seen lovely Laura Weston, who's one of the my fellow directors that Women's Sport Trust, wrote this letter when she was 10 or 11 to um, one of the broadcasters saying, there's just not enough women's coverage on television. So I was wow. so naive to it. I didn't. But how amazing that. And she's younger than me. So maybe it was in more recent years. But I don't think I was like an activist in the way that my children are now absolutely they recognize the injustice and the inequality I just didn't see it um so I think that I did more within women's sports I think we started working within hockey so we did back to hockey and we started working more with the in, with a hockey team ahead of um 2012 we worked with them in 2011 so I think it was probably around that time that we began to do more in sport and I began to feel uh, like I really liked working in women's sport and it didn't have that opportunity. And then probably when I met Tammy and Joe from the Women's Sport Trust in 2012, I think that cemented, it made me go, oh, wow, that's what's been driving me all this time, running this agency, wanting to get more work in women's sport and do more with the RFU and Alex Teasdale and all the rest of it, and, and really passionate about it, but running an agency that represented men and women and fitness, and so I wasn't able to take that route. So I think it was probably for me early 2000s, uh, that I began to see but sorry that was a really long answer to your question was there a moment no <laughs> <laughs> love it absolutely love it Ailey Barber um you'll know that the presenter is you know a ridiculous golfer she's invited to all the pro-am stuff because she's very good at it uh, but she was also a footballer she'll claim that she's too broken now to play but I'm pretty confident she'd still be able to play she wrote a letter to Hazel Irvin when she was a kid, a similar age, I think, to say, I want your job. And I, I'm, I've got two bits to that. One is I love that, that she wanted to be a presenter in sport. And I don't think I've ever asked her, but I do wonder if that was because she didn't see the channel for a professional to, to become a sports person herself. The, the presenters, you've got Laura Woods on your on the documentary and you know there's there's lots now of female presenters in all the sports on all the channels and it's changed from the sky sports of old where maybe they weren't really there for the sport and um, how important is that then because you've spoken a little bit about jobs in sport that women are being seen in those roles yeah so so important I, it's interesting that you say that about um Hazel Irving said, so I wanted to be a sports presenter. Then when I think, look back to, especially at university and what I would like to have done, I think being a sports presenter, well, there probably weren't as many at the time, but I think I love sport and I felt like I wanted to present. So I do feel like I've had this, um, whatever it is, 
uh, second stage encore career, isn't it? Where I've now got a podcast and <laughs> documentary and I'm took into my 50s. That's it. Don't just keep keep going and you get there in the end. Uh, but no, I think it's so, so important that we we see them and celebrate them. And they're there covering both men's and women's sport, too. And, you know, and likes of Sue Barker and Claire Bordy. And again, that whole recognising those that were there before and fought so hard to, you know, be accepted and, and um, be respected. So, yeah, it's great that more and more are coming through that path now. Yeah, I'm, I'm not allowed to speak to Claire Balding. I think there's a restraining order on <laughs> on me for Claire Balding. But the the bit that quite often gets lost to Claire Balding, I love that there's the there's the horse part to it, which maybe works. But then rugby league, I I love that there's those two, and people a lot of people don't realise that the the love and the passion for rugby league, which I think is just monumental. But she speaks really passionately, doesn't she? She gets really emotive around the whole thing. Yeah, around so many sports. Such as one of my questions to her was, how do you keep up? How do you talking, you know, d darts one day, racing the next, uh, rugby league, as you say. And I think it is just a passion to learn more, to understand the stories, to share and know that she doesn't need to be the expert in everything. She's she's the person that's gathering the content, you know, now Wimbledon uh, and bringing others on that journey. So, yeah, she's <laughs> quite amazing. I yeah, love Claire Balding. I think I can't remember. I think it's Tammy Gray Thompson talks about in the documentary. And I've got two quotes here. There's the Nelson Mandela one about sport has the power to change the world, which I think we all agree with. That's why we're doing things like this. And I don't know who this is attributed to, but I've seen it attributed to Keith Wood, the Irish rugby player. But I think it's just one of those things. It's, and it's sport is the most important thing in the world. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And ta she talks about sport being used for more, for society, for communities. For is, is that true, or are we are we making sport more important than actually it is? No, I really, really think it is. I love that quote. I'm going to make make a note of that and use that in the future. Um, but no, I, I really think it is because it is just everywhere in society. And I think even if you don't like sport and you're not a fan of sport, it's still on at the end of every news bulletin and every newspaper. And it's, you know, and it is part of our culture and whether it is hosting major championships or it's a week to week of and the work that football foundations and us do in the community too so I think it it does touch people even if you don't consider yourself to be a sports fan I think it is that piece that is woven through and probably a little bit like maybe music or uh, you know in that whole cultural side perhaps religion other things that unite people and are very much part of life for some um, but not for everybody, but they still impact everybody. So, yeah, I, I think sport is one of those uh, few things. But as you say, yeah, not important and yet so important. It's fascinating, isn't it? Well, I mean, last summer, last summer, the Lionesses? Yeah. Two, last summer, yeah. every everybody knew what was going on, whether you loved football or not, whether you watched male sport or not. The Lionesses gripped everyone and the atmosphere after the games i just wanted to be there when they're playing freed from desire and they're dancing in front <laughs> of the crowd and nobody went home you know you'll have been to sporting events like me where the security are sweeping you out two minutes after the final whistle get going i don't know how that contract worked for the <laughs> europeans because they seem to stay forever and then they get to ride the wave over it as a world cup coming up the the big job's going to be in those sort of fallow periods where it's not a major championship and that's where building the workforce becomes important where do you see good work or challenges for building the workforce yeah i'm gonna, i was going to not not answer a question but i thought your question was going to go obviously those big you know tent peg whatever tent pole moments of um the world championships olympics etc it's the domestic leagues that we need to thrive and, and to encourage and i think that's what we are seeing with wsl so those figures consistently week to week it's great that people find women's sport uh, in those big moments but actually it's where we need you know and who knows what happened with pwr but hopefully it'll have a you know free to air and maybe paid for uh, in the way that um the WSL has had and the championship with, with Sky and BBC. So I think having that regular, consistent coverage is so key to finding audiences and, you know, creating and sustaining that beyond 
the short term ashes every you know home ashes every four years whatever so uh yeah i do think that'll be that's really really key and in terms of workforce yeah absolutely that's something i feel very passionate about getting more women into those senior leadership roles uh, and seeing those opportunities to work across sport but that's men's and, and women's sport too yeah getting people to value the volunteering and how much you get back from helping others and seeing the development we can't all produce Jess Kynes or Chloe Williamson or whoever, but we can play a part in making the community a bit stronger. Looking ahead, I'll give you a crystal ball. What does it look like in five years' time? By then, we'll have been through another cycle of World Cups and Olympics. Where do you see women's sport in five years' time? Yeah, I do. I am excited for it. You you just mentioned then the whole we can't all be coaches to Jess Ennis Hill or whoever else. And I and I do think for me it's about the whole of the ecosystem of women's sport. And I think I hope that's what came across in the documentary when you mentioned, you know, the kind of walking netball right down to the grassroots activity too. Um that it that I I hope in the next five years that yeah, we'll see profile and visibility and funding, all those things I've been very passionate about through the Women's Sport Trust, but also about access and pitches and changing rooms and clothing and talking openly about women's bodies and making sure girls have as much access as men and women have access throughout their lives as they get older. So all of those things. So and it's huge, isn't it? But it but for me, the tip of the iceberg is red roses and the lionesses and all that. You know, amazing profile of those athletes and how we aspire to that. Um, but that is only a few hundred athletes at the end of the day. Actually, for me, it's the millions of women and girls feeling like there's a place for them in sport. They're not going to be judged. They have access and opportunity. That's the bit that will really change lives in society. So I, so I do feel um, the, the part where I spent much of my time is on that profile and funding and visibility and, you know, professional contracts, which is really important. Uh, but actually, it's as, as important, if not more, the way that sport can change lives uh, for all women and for women across all of their lives too. So that it isn't just something during school or university, but it's something um that and, and again physical and mental well-being but also around loneliness and feeling apart and having a sense of purpose and all those things that we know uh sport brings so i, I think sometimes not we get carried away with the high visibility stuff that is really important uh but let's not forget uh the importance in schools and teach you know teachers and access and and all those areas of sport too we, well we'd need to do another hour bruce if we don't have another hour for that right. hey, I'll, i will have you back for that no problem <laughs> So uh, we're we're beginning to wind down here, but here you, you mentioned it there, and it, it's something that I've only come to in the last few years, where the physical activity, if we f not forget, but if we stop focusing on the physical bit, and we talk about the mental and emotional bit. So I ran a marathon in May. Now, let's not get too excited about that. But when I trained, I felt better. It helped me. I can't run with things in my ears because I like to be aware of what's going on. So it was just me and my thoughts. However long I ran for it, I did some training runs that lasted a couple of hours and I did some that lasted half an hour. But I felt better. Now, the, the longer term effect was physically things were improved. But because it doesn't have an instant impact, that wasn't my focus. My focus was I need to get across the line in this marathon but I felt better so that's then led to me feeling like I can keep running how do we sell that you know you worked in marketing and PR and you worked at the top level but how do we get those people that live on this street here to get involved in physical activity because of how it makes them feel I think I mean, for people generally, but we, I can talk more specifically for, I guess, women's sport, this, you know, the power of this girl can, the power of campaigns that show people they can be and do. I've just had a message today from Get Berkshire Active about doing a, a Berkshire can, girl can or whatever. So in the area, and I'm doing a little piece around my open water swimming or my walking netball and what it means to me and the difference it makes in my life. Even once a week, you know, Sunday morning, swimming, cold water swimming with amazing women once a week has transformed how I feel about myself for the rest of the week and how I feel about, you know, absolutely mental health. It's this kind of spiritual side of being in the middle of a lake in nature. Just fantastic. So I, so I think it probably is, 
not campaigns, but not in a campaigning sense, but sharing the stories and letting people see it's there. And then it's everything else as well, isn't it? It's the system of accessibility and affordability and doing it with other people and all those things that I guess Sport England and the like have been trying to fix for decades and you know do amazing things in that area. So I think it's about telling the stories and celebrating those that are doing it uh, and making it um accessible and easy and the thing I often say it's almost like well, I don't really like sport this so it doesn't have to be one thing or another my um youngest daughter went down recently to Brighton and started bouldering and she's like oh, I absolutely love bouldering it's the most she's never done it before but the fo from a mental health point of view that being only focused on the next client you know where you're going to go next she found it extraordinary so it's almost at any stage at any age there is something out there. I think I think we think of sport sometimes and we think of team sport and, you know, that whole competitive on a pathway. But actually, it's just at the end of the day, it's kind of play and move me, moving your body and being with others and all those fabulous things. So I, I think it's uh, uh, keep letting people know there's so much out there and, and profiling the impact that it can have. Yeah, that's maybe where language comes in, isn't it? It's not necessarily sports, physical activity. It's just, it's yeah. just being active. And the, you said you mentioned loneliness answer before, and then you've spoken about social and meeting people. That's bring a friend. I think every sport should have that as a slogan. Bring a friend, mm -hmm. you know, bring someone along. My wife went back to play hockey in her 40s, and she just, she would come in, and I would say, how did it go? And she would end up telling me that she got carded because her body's not doing what <laughs> her brain tells her to. But then she got player of the year. So in her 40s, she gets player of the year going back to hockey. And it was just such a positive thing for the kids to see, for me to yeah, see, for her yeah. to feel. Um, and there, there is things out there, but it just needs to be advertised and promoted and those stories sold and you're doing a fabulous job of that is there anything if you had a magic wand or if there was one thing there's no silver bullet for all this but if there was one thing that you could see happening tomorrow what would it be I think it's probably it's not as um, maybe not as sexy as the uh, sponsorship and funding and visibility, but I think more women in senior leadership roles across sport and not just on boards, but being around the table in decision making, whether that's FIFA, UEFA, or, or, and those those big sports bodies, right down to grassroots clubs and places and sponsors and broadcasters and media. So I think more women in, in leadership positions is the, probably the piece that could have the biggest impact on a long term basis. Thank you so much. I've I've absolutely loved it. I'm now looking at the clock and thinking I thought we just started. Um, <laughs> I, I could talk to you forever. I love the documentary. Um, uh, to follow you on social media, you know, seeing these inspiring stories. I only mentioned Victoria Rush. She's someone I was going to talk to you about, but we've kind of run out of time. She's had a significant impact on certainly on rugby and and on the conversation. So, Sue, I, you're a busy lady. I did tell you this was going to happen. I'm intrigued as to where this is going to go. So, for me, happiness is egg-shaped. For you, Sue, happiness is? Happiness is um, probably in a caravan on the southwest France with my lovely family and the dog, lovely camping holiday. Although although I'm slightly concerned that I maybe have a bit of rose-coloured spectacles because we don't always get on when we're all together. <laughs> but in my, in my truly happiness place, we're having a good couple of weeks in the south of france that's well looking out my window at the moment that sounds absolutely spectacular <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you so much enjoy everything that's coming up i wish you all mm -hmm. the very best and and i'll watch with great interest and hopefully one day we'll, we'll meet in person i can't believe we haven't but yeah i hope that too thank you so much <laughs> thank you sue absolutely amazing uh, you can't help but be inspired and i've got that silly grin on my face again uh, the intimidation disappeared pretty quickly i hope you hope you saw that and heard that amazing so many stories so many things to think about get out there and get active and take people with you uh, i look forward to seeing what the future brings if you enjoyed that you can catch us on apple acast and spotify you can watch on facebook and youtube tell your friends leave us a review and remember just like my mum says if you've got nothing nice to say then don't say anything at all but please spread the good stuff. I look forward to seeing you all again soon. My name is Bruce Aitchison from the Happiness Is podcast and my happiness is egg-shaped. Hello all Happiness Is Egg-shaped listeners and watchers. This is the Happiness Is podcast with me, your host, Bruce Aitchison, brought to you in association with Infinity Blue. They can look after you whether it is a checkup, teeth whitening, or a more complicated procedure. 
Give them a call, get in touch, and they will look after you to make sure that you keep that smile intact. Because after all, they know, we know, I know, you know, happiness is egg-shaped.